Coming up on this episode, we'll take a closer look at the Ampeg B12 amp and we'll talk with Steely Dan lead guitarist, John Harrington. I'm Brian Lippi and this is Guitar Shop TV, the place to take your axe to the max. Hey guys, welcome to the show. I had an opportunity recently to chat with Bob Updike of Bob's Lone Star Guitars in Dallas, Texas about the Ampeg B12 amp. Here are some highlights from our discussion about this great studio staple. Bob and I looked at a few unusual axes and some great vintage amps. Bob has a number of vintage Harmony and K guitars in stock, which have real historical interest. During the 1950s and 60s, both K and Harmony made all kinds of guitars for retail store chains and mail order outlets, which had no guitar making facilities of their own, but wanted to cash in on the huge demand for guitars and amps by having their own brand names on the guitar products. In addition to manufacturing instruments for sale under their own brands, K guitars manufactured for Sears Roebuck under the Silvertone brand and Harmony for Montgomery Ward. Now, in addition to a gorgeous 1965 Sunburst Epiphone Riviera with a distinctive Epi Vibrato tailpiece, Bob showed me some great vintage amps, including a number of cool Gibson amps from the Golden Age, such as the Skylark, the Explorer, and the Falcon models. But my favorite was the way cool Ampeg B12 an all-tube flip-top model with two channels to accommodate both guitar and accordion with separate reverb. The flip-top model had a chassis that could be inverted and tucked inside the speaker enclosure to protect the vacuum tubes. This combo amp became known, became known as the Portaflex and remained a popular choice throughout the 1960s. You can find out more about Bob's Lone Star Guitars at guitarshoptv.com. Our guest today is one of the most respected and versatile guitarists on the contemporary rock scene, Steely Dan lead guitarist John Harrington. Now John's amazing artistry embraces a wide range of rock, blues, and jazz influences uniquely interpreted in his own original musicality. Check out our amazing interview with John Harrington. Well, it was, it was uh, around, uh, I was in eighth grade, I think. Um, well, actually, I probably was interested in playing guitar earlier than that, probably when I saw the Beatles on TV, you know, because I remember making cardboard cutouts of John Lennon's guitar and uh, jumping up and down on the sofa, you know, like, <laughs> that's the one, right? <laughs> and um, so I was kind of interested in that, I mean, you know, really fell in love with that music and a lot of pop music of the time, but it wasn't until about... Uh, I think it was 1968 I started actually playing guitar. Um, I had been in, in a band uh, which rehearsed in my basement. My mother was the only one in the neighborhood who allowed the kids to make noise, you know, in the house. So uh, there were a couple guitar players in the band. They used to leave their guitars in the basement, you know, with a drum set and a bass and all that. So, and I was a saxophone player at the time. Oh, right. Now, where, where was this? What this was in West Long Branch, New Jersey, okay. I, where I grew up. It's, it, the Jersey Shore. It's kind of Bruce Springsteen country, yeah. really. I, he I he used up, to play at our high school dances, in fact. Is you know, that so. with Steel Mill? Was yeah, it? with Steel Mill and Earth. Right. Was Child, another one called Child. Right. Three bands, I remember. But he was definitely a local hero. But, um, but I, uh, I, was a, I had played a little piano and taken some piano lessons when I was a kid. And then I also played some saxophone through grade school. And so we had a band, and uh, I played saxophone in the band. There really wasn't much to play, because the music we wanted to do was all sort of, you know, kind of current pop music. And, uh, and, but, the, but because the, the guitar players, they weren't real practicers. They left their guitars in the basement all the time. So I, it was like a field day for me. I just went downstairs every day and started playing their guitars all the time. And I started learning, and it wasn't long before I could play better than they could. <laughs> and, they, you know, what, wasn't, that wasn't much to speak of, really. But, uh, but over the, over the course of, uh, you know, uh, well, after about a year of that, I think my, my parents realized that 
I was interested in the guitar, and they, they got me an electric guitar. So, uh, so I, and then I started playing, you know, basically, you know, listen, I never took lessons uh, for another five or six years, but, um, but I basically started, like, dropping the needle on records and, and trying my best to figure out by ear what was going on. And, so who were your early influences in those days? Uh, Cream, you know, Hendrix, uh, the Beatles, the Stones, uh, all, all that, uh, that late 60s, most, mostly British Invasion pop rock stuff. You know. Did Hendrix, Hendrix uh, affect your style at all? Yeah, uh, although, um, you know, I, I think a little less somehow than, than Cream, you know, and Clapton, Cla that, that era Clapton, that seems to have been more what I was drawn to. I'm not sure exactly why. I mean, I always loved Hendrix, but it always seemed uh, just fringe or something in terms of like, like approach for, for me, just as far as, I mean, it's fantastic, of course, you know, nothing like it. But also I wasn't, I was never drawn to the sound of, of the Strat, you know, even though it's fantastic, you know, on, in so many, it, it's so flexible and versatile. I always was, I always loved that sort of fatter, maybe it, maybe it was the saxophone or something, more, more horn-like tone or something, you know. That uh, big, rich, creamy tone. Like I that. was more, always more interested in, in like, like that, that uh, the Clapton tone on, you know, the live cream stuff at right. the late, six, in the late 60s always was just such a beautiful thing to me and like and and I don't know I guess I just was drawn to that sound more so I, I was playing a Les Paul at one uh, that was the yeah yeah and uh, and an overdriven amp you know um, but you know I boy over the years you know the, the Hendrix thing is such an unusual sound and like so much of it's about that well it's the amp obviously but but it's that guitar and it's and the, the lower tuning really gave it a kind of power but it's it, those recordings are done so well I think they did just such a beautiful job recording it that that uh, it's just a larger than life kind of sound and yeah, it's very hard to get get live you know for me and, and again I, I spent so little time with a Strat I'm not so comfortable playing a Strat for some reason mm. always been more because I guess I grew up on Gibson's I I'm always more comfortable with that yeah. that kind of sound well, and that kind of feeling. you know started with that SG, uh, the SG standard which I guess it was using on um, Part of really here, but then the 335. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, for me, the, the, a Gibson is going to be, like all the Gibsons kind of are in the same ballpark to me, even regardless of, you know, whether they're hot, hollow, solid, semi-hollow, you know, they, they all sort of do a similar thing. And I think it's it's scale length and those and the pickups, you know. So maybe something else about the construction, but there's, but there, there's Gibsons and then there's Fenders and, you know, there's certainly differences between Strats and Tellys, and you know, but uh, but really, for me, you can make those like those two camps are so different just just from just because of the, I think it's the scale length most of the, and the and the pickup, the, the, and the bolt on or the neck through that that may make sense. That's probably part of it too. Those three things are so different on each guitar. They, they're different worlds. You know. That was great, John. Thanks so much for joining us on Guitar Shop TV. Now, if there's an artist you'd like to see interviewed on the show, let us know. Post your comment in the box below, find us on Facebook, or email us at info at guitarshoptv.com. We'd love to hear from you. Our viewer question this week comes from Jack from Chester, Nova Scotia, Canada, who writes, I just love the sound of the Gibson J160E. It has such a unique acoustic sound, big, boxy, and rich, just like all those great classic Beatles tracks from A Hard Day's Night and Rubber Soul. But I almost never see it around nowadays. Any thoughts? Well, Jack, you have a great ear. The J160E is a rare bird. It was introduced by Gibson in 1954 as one of its first amplified versions of an acoustic guitar through its single coil pickup and volume and tone controls. Of course, it could always be played as a straight acoustic as well. I've always loved it personally because of its history, but also its unique sound. John Lennon and George Harrison of the Beatles each owned one, but it wasn't very popular with many players. Most thought it sounded more like a hollow body electric than an amplified acoustic. Gibson stopped producing the J160E in 1977 but reintroduced them a few years ago, and now it's produced by Gibson in its Montana factory. 
Gibson's sister company, Epiphone, recently produced a EJ160E. It's John Lennon's replica signature model that's produced in Indonesia, but it's a longer scale length and a different color than the earlier Korean-made Epiphone EJ160E. The current model looks and sounds great at a very attractive price point. Thanks for your question. Well, that wraps things up for this episode. Thanks so much for watching and tune in again next week. I'm Brian Lippi and this is Guitar Shop TV, the show that helps you take your axe to the max. See you next week.